Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. This is God's word. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished. And said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So far the reading of God's holy word we give thanks for it. You may be seated. As we come to consider this portion of scripture, let us pray for God's help. Almighty God, we are thankful that in your providence today we come to this portion of your word about treasure. And where to find it. And where to find confidence and stability. And we are thankful Uh, for the gospel demonstrated in this text as well. And we know that your word is profitable uh, for your people. And so we ask that you use it this morning to build us up, that we might know your work on our behalf more fully, more clearly, and that you might make us stronger because of it. Overcome the deficiencies of the preacher. They are many. And bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word to bring forth fruit in our hearts to love you more 
to serve you better. We ask it all for the precious sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Uh, I am not terribly afraid of heights, but am instantly uncomfortable on ladders. Um, when, when I was in college, I, mean, I, work, I worked in a warehouse and would outright climb the, the still, steel shelving uh, all the way near to the ceiling to get something off the top shelf, but you asked me to go four rungs up a ladder, uh, and oh, I'm pretty shaky. Um, so you, you might be asking, well, what makes the difference between these two things? Stability, right? It's not where I am that's unsettling. It's what's supporting me while I'm there. And if we're honest, I think that to some degree or other, maybe not the exact example, but the situation resonates with most of us. You're probably okay being on the 100th floor of a skyscraper if you're inside the building. Uh, Switch places with the person washing the window at the 100th floor on that little cart held by a couple of ropes. And I mean, your anxiety levels probably start to creep up the scale. You ask me to go on a balcony 10 stories up. Well, I'm likely to do that. You ask me to go on one of those rides that straps you into a flimsy little harness and slingshots you 10 stories in the air. I might think about slapping you. <laughs> um, in all sorts of ways, it, it matters what is supporting us and what is providing our stability. In Mark 10, 17 to 31, Jesus puts his finger right on the issue of stability. This wealthy inquisitor approaches him looking for advice what he must do to inherit everlasting life, presumably looking for some assurance, some security, some stability for his outlook on his prospects of going to heavenly reward rather than to condemnation. And Jesus' response is in a number of ways shocking. Throughout this whole discussion, however, he, he addressed the need to have confidence in the right things. Since the wrong things will lead only to insecurity and trouble. As we've seen, Mark's gospel is about who Jesus is and what his kingdom is like. In our previous passage, in in verses 13 to 16, Jesus had remade, re-emphasized the point that entry into God's kingdom must be received as a gift. For those who see their neediness, despite the disciples' perception that that only important people should get direct access to Christ, Jesus explained that we have to receive the kingdom like a child would. Namely, in utter dependence, as we accept Christ's blessing upon us. And... In our passage here, status remains the problematic issue. This this man's approach to Jesus, the way that he comes to Jesus, suggests uh, deep respect. Which, when when we think about it, is exactly how the worldly minded think of Christ up to a point. Respect. Until... His message that they are not good enough to earn his favor registers. It's easy to like Jesus if you think he's going to ask you just to do some virtue signaling about the things you like. And undermining his whole denial of status, Jesus continually heightened his requirements for this man to, to highlight how Entry into the kingdom cannot be attained by what we do. 
What does it mean to come to Christ as needy people then? What does it mean to engage with Jesus' challenge about the difficulty of entering God's kingdom? And as, as we reflect upon this passage, I hope we see both great comfort in the takeaway from Jesus' conversation with the rich young man and find uh, a growing challenge, an exciting challenge, although it's a real challenge, to help us think about our discipleship as we consider his interaction with his own disciples. And so our main point is that true treasure is obtained by trusting Jesus. True treasure is obtained by trusting Jesus. And we're going to think about this today in three points. Security, submission, and satisfaction. Uh, it, it, it used to be, uh, sorry, so our first point is security. Security. It, it, it used to be the, the common sort of tactic in, in evangelism. The most popular sort of approach in evangelism was to ask you know, something like, if you stood before God right now and he asked you why he should let you into his heaven, what would you say? And that's not really been my primary. I think it, I think it worked better in a, in a previous generation than it does now. But every now and then, it, you know, you, you throw it in to see how it lands. <laughs> Almost inevitably, the answer, even maybe even especially from purporting Christians, is I tried my best to live a good life for God. So that, God, you should let me in because I tried. Now in Mark 17, the, the first stretch, or sorry, Mark 10, uh, the first stretch in verses 17 to 22, uh, Christ kind of pokes that mindset right in the eyeball. Because this man comes eagerly to Jesus and asks, good teacher, what, what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And clearly, this man had missed Jesus' message about how the kingdom has to be received as a gift, not earned. And that's likely why, I mean, the fact that he not listened, at least, to Jesus' message is likely why Jesus presumes that this man also didn't understand that he's God. The, the divine Messiah, far from deflecting from his own divine identity, he's hooking into this man's true problem. Only God is good, so if you want to do something to inherit life, well, keep his law to the standard of God's own character. And of course, this guy rejoiced because he thought, well, I tried hard enough to do that, that that it would meet the bar of keeping these commandments. I've done them since I was a kid. And he told Jesus that. And Jesus responded, okay, fine, you think that? Go sell everything you have. Sell your belongings to follow me. Because this man was rich, he lamented that particular instruction. Because he couldn't keep that one. Now we need to see that Jesus' real point was to zero in on where this man found his security, his stability, his support. Jesus recognized that this man found his stability in himself. His view of goodness was defined by human achievement. He thought his good deeds measured up. He he couldn't understand how he would be safe if he let go 
of his riches, the things that clearly were the things he trusted. And Jesus told him where real assurance is found. Because what's the, what's the contrast that we, we see? Do the commands depend on earthly means or come, follow me? Those are the alternatives. Do it yourself or follow Jesus. We can hold on to our own efforts or we can hold on to Christ. And Christ was trying to show this man that that true hope, I mean, because the one, you can't do it. And so true hope resides only in utter reliance upon Him. And we're back then to what we thought about explicitly a few weeks ago about that classic, wonderful distinction between the law and the gospel. The law says do it, but the gospel says done. You can rely on your works, or you can rely on Christ's works. And those are the options. And Jesus likely had in mind passages like Ezekiel 33, 15 that we read, or Leviticus 18.5, which is, is used. I mean, Levit- or, sorry, Ezekiel 33 is basically a, an expansion, an application of Leviticus 18.5. That the one who does these things will live. And these verses connect life to the doing of the law. And if you want to earn life, if you want to earn it, then you need to fulfill God's commands perfectly. On the other hand, if you know you can't do that one, you can follow Jesus. Trusting in his works as earning the kingdom for you. Now imagine... I. Uh, You've seen, probably all of you have seen some sort of movie, TV show, that dramatic moment where somebody's hanging off a cliff and the potential rescuer screams, take my hand. The one in danger struggles to take hold of the rescuer's hand because because it means taking their own hand off the branch or the edge or whatever it is. And trusting in someone else's grip rather than their own. It's frightening. And this call to follow Jesus shows that the deepest answer to the question about inheriting everlasting life is the offer to lay hold of authentic life as a gift through union with Christ by faith. Jesus invited this man, and by implication each one of you, to let go of everything that he thought should give him security so that his hands would be freed to take hold of Christ as true security. That brings us to our second point, submission. One of the big questions that people ask always, it seems, coming away from this passage, is if Jesus' instruction to go sell everything, to follow him, is a universal prescription for Christians. Is this something Jesus meant for every Christian to do? Or not. In other words, right, just to put the, the fine head on it, do you need to sell everything to follow Jesus? And I want to wade into this discussion to show how Christian discipleship, well, challenges us to have a posture to be continually open to correction, to growth, and to listening. Uh, so, you know, it's probably not going to surprise you. My basic answer to that question, do I have to sell everything, is no. Um, 
No, this passage isn't about demanding every single Christian to sell everything as a, as a condition for following Jesus. And now, the thing that may surprise you is the reason that I think that's the case, that the answer is no, is because that would actually be too easy. You could do it. You could just do that, one off. It, you know, it's an admittedly difficult thing to sell everything you own, to get rid of your stuff. But then one thing ticked off the list, you're a buttoned up disciple, no more growing room. You know, th- there would, if this were just the universal condition, there would, there would be no ongoing wrestling in discipleship with what does submission to Jesus look like with the things that I love. Reducing this passage's demand to a a one-off deed rather than the call to listen to Jesus always. Possessions were the flashpoint for this man. The, The issue about which Jesus needed to deal with his heart possessions, if, if, if we have great wealth, can give a, a sense of great comfort that is hard to relinquish, which is exactly what prompted Jesus to say that it's essentially impossible uh, for the rich to enter God's kingdom. And, of course, Jesus is, is putting his finger back in the eye of the whole issue. Because you think, well... If it's impossible, then what are we supposed to do? Well, with man it is impossible. But not with God. For all things are possible with God. If you're resting in your own strength, your law keeping, your possessions, your prestige, your ability just to you make good decisions, then you'll, if you're resting in that, if you're trusting in that, you'll never make it into God's kingdom. Because you have to receive the kingdom as a gift from Christ by faith. Kingdom entry, entry into the kingdom is possible from God's side because he can give it to you by grace even though you can never earn it. But even those without great worldly possessions, I mean, in the the view that we're taking here, that this is a confrontation with this man, that leaves it so that even those without great worldly possessions are, are confronted by this passage about following Christ in whatever discipleship might require. Right? The, the law gospel distinction clarifies for us uh, being r- the premises of being right with God. But it, but it really doesn't erase the, the challenge built into the Christian life. The difficulty of wrestling with these things in an ongoing way. I mean, think about, think about verse 28. Peter, sorry, Peter began to say to him, See, we, we've left everything and followed you. So Peter has some self-congratulation. Hey, I, I did that thing that you said was the next up condition. We did the hard thing you told that guy to do. So we're fine, right? And... And Jesus' response drives beyond possessions to all of life. Are you going to put everything in my hands? Because now I'm talking about giving up every aspect of life that belongs to people, regardless of material wealth. Where you stay, your family. Are you... Are you open to what I have to say now? And so Jesus' ethic is uncompromising in in what it excludes from the basis of our trust. You don't get to depend on 
any of it, even in keeping what might seem like the most difficult command for that guy. In other words, even those who thought that they had given all they had, Jesus points to them, Jesus points them to what else could be demanded from them. Yeah, I was dealing with that guy's heart. Do you want me to deal with yours? Because we can bring up some other things that I could ask from you. The point cannot be about just money, but has to be about submission to Christ in all things. And so, I mean, in that second half of this passage, throughout the whole of verses 23 to 31, Jesus refused to give comfortable answers, even to his disciples. I think we're mistaken to lock on to riches as as the thing itself, since Jesus' uncompromising ethic was, well, foundationally, his commitment to, to challenge us on all matters concerning what we love if we are ready to listen, if we're ready to be corrected and ready to grow whatever he puts in front of us. Most of us don't like the challenge to our status quo. We want to get our jobs in order, our politics in order, our family commitments in order, and then resolve that God has rubber-stamped our mindset just like we are. Yeah, I'm imperfect, but that's just a matter of degree. Certainly, now, I mean, we've got to be clear. We need to circle back to, to the gospel side of this. Christ accepts you as a person by his grace. But clearly, he is out, out to challenge our mindset about everything. In no area of life should we feel like we've just settled the pattern and have no new ways to grow and to learn. Discipleship is an ongoing challenge of submission to Christ in all things. I, the longer I thought about this, I'm not even sure that Jesus wants us to have a status quo. Because without it, That means submission to him is always about trusting him as our stability. There's not a fixed answer to get you to the end of the road in the Christian life. And that brings us to our third point, satisfaction. Satisfaction. That that call to submission to Christ in all things can be a potentially scary aspect of discipleship. What if he asked me to sell everything I have? What if he asks me something harder than that for me to give up? And I think one of the things that we we have to see is that when Jesus told that man to sell his possessions, it was exactly what he needed for his spiritual good. What, is, what does it say, verse 21? And Jesus, he's about to say the hardest thing in the whole conversation. And what's, what's driving that? And Jesus, looking at him, Loved him. And so he said the hardest thing he could come up with to him. Because that's what the guy needed. Some people uh, actually even think that this rich young... uh, There's no way to substantiate this as far as I know. Uh, Some people think that this rich young man was Mark. As in Mark who wrote this gospel. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. 
But the possibility itself shows us what, and the fact that we can entertain it genuinely, shows us what Christ can do through hard challenges like this one. And so the point is, the point is that even though that seems like that challenge seems so scary, We are relieved of our fear about submission to Christ when we are convinced that he is trustworthy. It's not scary to follow someone who has our full confidence. The path may be difficult, but our guide is an expert and knows exactly where he needs to take us. I started this week uh, knowing this passage was coming, excited that I thought this is going to be a, an easy kind of doctrinal reflection on the law gospel distinction. That'll be fun for me. Uh, and there was a lot of hard news this week. And we've got to think about that. Families who belong to us have suffered horrific loss. And real turmoil continues to weigh on lots of you. And you know what, it's it's not my place to um, broadcast your troubles and process them out loud. And so I kind of want to think about my own example. And my, I don't mean this to think about what's going on with me. I hope that this gives you space to process whatever it is that's going on with you. So my pastor was killed in a car wreck on Thursday morning. Kind of a, a shock, something you can't see coming. You know, I... I learned to pray before every sermon that God would overcome my deficiencies because I heard Harry pray that Lord's Day after Lord's Day. And I didn't even realize it until last summer when I heard him before I came here. I'm glad I got to tell him that. You know, uh, in my wisdom, as I look at the situation and process, why would this be the case? I wouldn't have thought that the fitting end for a guy who pastors 4,000 members, well-known and respected around the the world, that his fitting end would be to smash into the back of a garbage truck. It seems just too menial. Why is this the case? I I wouldn't think that the hardships that weigh on you are the most obvious paths on which God should lead us. If I think about it from my wisdom. But our passage does speak to that. It teaches us just like he's teaching this rich young man, it teaches us to trust Christ beyond what we can see and beyond what we can understand. And so, even when I can't see, I trust our Savior. Some of it just seems so wrong. Why is this the case? And we remember Genesis 18.25 as Abraham sort of prays with God, will you, will you spare Sodom and Gomorrah because, because my family's there? Will you not destroy it? And he kind of comes to his first conclusion, for will not the judge of all the earth do right? got to leave ourselves in that. 
I don't get it. The judge of the earth will do right. The paths of the challenges that we face in the life of discipleship are often immensely hard. But Jesus is our expert guide. No matter the situation, no matter how hard it is, there is no safer place than following Jesus. And that is Jesus' rock bottom point in this passage. We can let good, we can let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also. Because his kingdom is forever. And he is our mighty fortress. I mean, Jesus' closing words make the point that he is trustworthy. And that even as we know loss in this life, there is satisfaction in following him. Doesn't he promise? Doesn't he promise that whatever we lose in following him by the gospel will be restored a hundredfold in the family of God? The challenges of discipleship are indeed immensely great as we traverse this pilgrim age, which is full of suffering. And we learn to rejoice that there is consolation for what is lost. Even when we cannot see how that consolation could be, just like we cannot see how reneging on our own strength could possibly help, we trust that Jesus is trustworthy. When the challenge seems impossible, and often it does, and sometimes it is, It's good to remember that the gospel says to let go of all that we can do so that we can take hold of what Jesus has done. And with God, all things are possible. We always come back to the fact every week that Jesus lived and died to forgive our sins. And we do well to remember it this morning. But you know what? Today, we need to emphasize that he stands in heaven to intercede for us. He is still guiding and leading us home. He is still caring for our souls. And he is still reigning on our behalf. We learn that life doesn't grant the security it offers. We wish it did, but Christ is able to give the satisfaction that he promises. So let us find ourselves in him, carried in his arms, trusting in him as true treasure. Because wherever we are, only Jesus has strength and stability to carry us through all the way to God's throne. Let's pray. Father God, we rejoice that we are able to rejoice even in our sufferings. That in a week full of of hard news that, well, Christ is still seated on the throne. And that even when hard things come our way, just as a hard instruction, a hard path of discipleship came before this man, we remember 
that Jesus told it to him because he loved him. In John 11, Lazarus' sisters come and say, Lazarus is dying. And Jesus, looking at them, as the text tells us, because he loved Lazarus, waited. Let him die. Because he loved him. He brought Lazarus back, certainly. But Lazarus didn't know that on the front end. And we don't know the good that you will do on the front end of our troubles. But despite what we can see, we are glad that Jesus Christ is leading. And we are glad that the emotions we need to feel are not singular As much as we need your strength, we're thankful for what it is you're about to do as we bring more people into our church family. What a joy to be reminded that you are still giving life, expanding life, working for the sake of life, even when we can so easily focus on when it is lost. And so we pray that you lift up our hearts as we welcome more believers into this family. Help us to know where our real treasure is. And that whatever we lose here, whether it be for a moment or for years, whatever we lose, you've promised a hundredfold consolation as you reign for your people and promise to come back for us. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ.